Let's now take a look at the two theorems of Hohenberg and Cohn that led to useful implementations, ultimately, of density functional theory. So the rigorous foundation that Hohenberg and Cohn established in 1964 is based on two theorems. So we'll look at each one, the first one in a bit more detail, and just talk about the second one. In any case, recall that density functional theory involves electrons interacting with one another and with an external potential. So that's the language that tends to be used in the physics community uh, because that potential could be general, but at least in chemistry, external potential effectively only means the potential of the nuclei, the nuclei clamped in their respective positions. So when you hear external potential, you can think of nuclear attraction usually. The first hohenberg cohn theorem, as originally formulated, applies to the ground state density of a system, and in particular a non-degenerate ground state density. There have been subsequent expansions of the theorem in various directions, but we'll just look at that uh, initial one. So external potential is the attraction of the nuclei. We get the number of electrons from integrating the density. And what we want to do is show that the ground state density uniquely determines the external potential. All right? That is, the ground state density uniquely determines the nuclear positions. And remember that once we know the nuclear positions, there is an exact wave function associated with those nuclei that number of electrons at those positions. And so if we can prove that a given density uniquely determines an external potential, then we know that there's a mapping relationship between a density and a wave function. So we can map the exact wave function and the exact density. The proof itself actually proceeds via a reductio ad absurdum. And so if you remember how that works in math, you make an assumption, you show that that sum assumption leads to an impossible result, and as a result, you know that your assumption must have been wrong. So, the hohenberg cohn theorem begins, then, with the following assumption. Assume that there are two different external potentials. So that means two different arrangements of nuclei, whether differing in charge or differing in positions, or both each consistent with the same non-degenerate ground state density. And so let's uh, call those potentials generated by those two different sets of nuclei little va and little vb. And remember that uh, those potentials, they determine Hamiltonians, ha and hb. So the Hamiltonian would be kinetic energy of electrons, attraction to nuclei, uh, and repulsion of electrons with one another. And what would differ, of course, in A and B would be where the nuclei are, for example. Now, for each HA and HB, it's an operator, so each one has a set of eigenfunctions, and one of them is the ground state eigenfunction, the wave function psi zero, and it has an eigenvalue E zero. And remember that from the variational theorem, we know that if I take the expectation value of HA, so that's corresponding to the nuclear positions that give the external potential VA, then any wave function I try, when I evaluate the energy of that wave function using the Hamiltonian with nuclei at positions A, I will get an energy greater than, or equal to, in the special case that B were identical to A, uh, greater than the ground state energy for A. And so let me just take this inequality and I will specify I'm going to add and subtract HB. So psi B, the, the B I'm actually using here, is the ground state energy of the wave function corresponding to nuclear positions at B. Right? And because the external potential uniquely defines the Hamiltonian, there is a ground state eigenfunction for that. So in any case, that's, and that's why, I guess I should roll back here one. So this is a strictly greater than symbol because I'm not using psi zero A. I said that VA and VB are different, and as a result, the two Hamiltonians are different, and they have different uh, eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. This is now the ground state eigenfunction for B, evaluated for the Hamiltonian with the nuclei at positions A. So it must be greater than E0A because I said my assumption is they're different external potentials. 
All right, and uh, now I will break up this difference and sum. I'll keep the difference over here. I've just got HB over here. So the expectation value of the ground state eigenfunction B for Hamiltonian B is just the ground state eigenvalue, so I'll just put that eigenvalue in. And though, then over here I have this term, the expectation value of psi, ground state psi for nuclei at positions B of the difference between the two potentials. Well, this potential, the, the difference between these two potentials, it's a, it's a one electron operator, uh, and as a result, I can write this in a form involving the density. So if I imagine psi times psi is integrated over all space of density, I now have that E, the ground state energy of A, is less than this difference plus the ground state energy of B. Okay, well this whole thing was just using some arbitrary labels, A and B. I could have started back in this last slide labeling this B and this A and this B and this A, right? So I would have gotten the same result that evaluating the other wave function over a given Hamiltonian will give you an energy greater than the ground state for that Hamiltonian. So I could just as easily swap all these indices here. So A becomes B, A becomes B, B becomes A, and so on. So this also must be true. But if I now subtract 9 from 10, excuse me, if I add 9 and 10, so I'm going to add this to this, add this to this, add this to this. So I'll get the sum of the two ground state energies. And then I get this integral plus this integral. But this is VB minus VA. This is VA minus VB. This is negative this. So this plus negative of this, that would all cancel. And I would get that the sum of these two ground state energies is less than the sum of these two ground state energies, but they're the same ground state energies. So that is clearly impossible. You can't have that A plus B is less than A plus B. Uh, and as a result, the assumption must have been incorrect. That is, there is not a single density that is associated with both external potentials A and external potentials B. It was that assumption of a single density that allowed us to cancel these two expressions, right? Because it's the same density appearing in this integral with this difference of potentials. Had we not assumed the same density, everything up till now would have been fine and this would not have canceled. But uh, by making that assumption, we'd get this impossible result. And so the first hohenberg cohn theorem shows that there is a unique mapping between a given density and its external potential, and hence a wave function. So as long as it's a non-degenerate ground state density, and we needed that in order to have that inequality of any expectation value would not be equal to the ground state, uh, we determine the external potential, we determine the Hamiltonian, we determine the wave function. And incidentally, remember that the Hamiltonian, it doesn't just determine the ground state wave function, it actually determines all the excited state wave functions too, right? Those are just the other eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So that is sort of a, a remarkable um, uh, phenomenon in, in some way, that the ground state electron density actually determines all the excited states as well. And so you can sort of ask yourself, hmm, I wonder what the densities of the excited states might be use, useful for. And that's still kind of an open question in some areas. But in any case, uh, subsequently, the hohenberg cohn theorem has been extended. And uh, you can actually show that it applies to the lowest energy non-degenerate state within each irreducible representation of the molecular point group. So that's a little bit of a group theory thing, and it extends it from just uh, the ground state to other uh, states as well that, that may, uh, may be of interest in certain s systems, but we won't explore that too much further. Now, the second hohenberg cohn theorem follows from the first. The first is an, ex an existence theorem, basically. It says, or maybe I shouldn't even call it an existence theorem, rather it is a proof of the relationship between the density and the wave function, that there's a one-to-one -one mapping. What it doesn't tell you is how to get the density that uh, is exact for a system. So how do we go about that? Well, the second uh, Hohenberg and Cohn theorem shows that the density obeys a variational principle. 
And just as with MO theory, we're always trying to optimize the energy to drive it down lower. And so Hohenberg and Cohn said that given a well-behaved density that integrates to the proper number of electrons, we know that theorem 1 says that density determines a candidate wave function, right? There is a unique mapping of a density to a wave function. We can evaluate the energy of that candidate wave function over the Hamiltonian corresponding to the density, and we will get some value for the energy, that is. And we know that it must be greater than or equal to the exact value because the exact value only comes from the exact density, which determines the exact Hamiltonian and the exact wave function. So that is a, an almost trivial proof in some sense that there is a variational principle, and it also offers you an operational approach to identifying this best density, that is, in principle, choose different densities that satisfy an external potential and so remember the external potential that's the nuclear positions so we need a density that has the right sort of cusp behavior and the right uh, 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 gradient spherically averaged gradient of the density at the nuclear positions but of course there's a lot of freedom in the other positions not not those exactly at the nuclei so we could just keep varying our density a bit subject to those constraints and as we drive energy down and down by constantly checking uh, by taking each of those densities and coming up with a corresponding wave function in Hamiltonian uh, you would get closer and closer to correct but how do you choose these improved densities that's you know the first question it's a little sounds like it would be sort of a pain to just be randomly varying the density at all positions in space Moreover, a part of the goal is not to have to solve a Schrodinger equation. That sounds quite unpleasant, as a matter of fact. We've, we've shown that there is a mapping, but we haven't exactly said how to accomplish that mapping. And in, indeed, you might imagine it would be a bit tricky. Well, in, in particular, figuring out the kinetic energy seems like it might be a bit tricky. So how can the density be used in a variational equation to determine the energy without recourse to the wave function? That is really what chemistry is waiting for in order for the big breakthrough of DFT uh, starting to be employed by your average everyday theoretician in his or her laboratories with his or her microcomputer. So in the next uh, lecture, we will take a look at the first practical applications.